Welcome back to Australia, Rob Thomas. How are you doing? So good to see you. It's good to see you, man. It's good to still be around. You're like almost Australian, aren't you? I am, I am so close. I am Australian adjacent. <laughs> you, like you come here a lot. Yeah, I've been coming here since 96 or so, since our first record. Um, you know, starting off doing the, doing the small theaters and stuff and then building our way up. And luckily they keep having me back, so I keep coming. How does it feel to come back down under? Um, it's an amazing, I think it's, it's amazing to come back somewhere that's so geographically far away from you, but you're so familiar with. You know, like it's a good thing to like to, you have friends that you want to see and restaurants that you want to find out and areas that you love to go to and things like that all over the, you know, all over the country. And I think that that's kind of like a surreal experience to know that you have that kind of a comfort from someplace that a lot of your friends will never go to. Yeah. 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 And how's 2019 been treating you so far? Um, it's been good. I was, I was here in Australia in May doing just kind of like a promo run, running around, then went straight home. And pretty much since I got home, I've been out on the road the whole time. Mm-hmm. You're coming up to a 30-year anniversary of making music. Yep. Oosh. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it, it's getting, how's that, it's how's getting that in feel? there. Um, well, I mean, listen, I've been making music since I was 14. It's just people started listening around 1996. <laughs> but it must feel good to kind of be, you know, these milestones kind of keep coming up. Obviously, you would have done 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of making music. Yeah, I mean, I think we were, you know, we were really lucky because we came up in a time where, if you think about 90, 96, when our first record came out with Matchbox, that was kind of like, we didn't know it at the time, but it was kind of like one of the last gasp of the traditional music business and the way that things got done. You know, there was, I was actually on the plane with, with the guys in the Black Eyed Peas and we were talking about, you know, all of us were kind of in that last group that could go out and sell 20 million records, like actual physical albums. And you didn't realize then that what you were really doing was kind of buying the ticket that was going to keep you on the ride. You know, like you, it's not about kind of maintaining a success. It's about being able to have a certain amount of success at one time that will bring enough people in so that for hopefully the rest of your career, you'll have a group of initiated people that want to hear what you have to say and want to come and see you, you know, when you have music to play. I, I love that analogy that buying the ticket for the, for the ride for the rest of your life? Yeah, I think, you know, it, like you look now and, and it, you could pick at any point along the last, you know, every decade, you're like, okay, well, like I remember when, when we started out and then, I'm sorry, when Maroon 5 started out, like they were opening up for us when, they, when no one had ever heard of them. And then they, like two or three years later, then they, they were having that moment, you know? And now they can play as long as they want to play. They, you know, they, they bought that ticket as well. So if you're ever lucky enough to kind of have, you know, a really big success, you, if you're not naive enough to think that that success is going to last forever, you know, then you're practical enough to kind of realize that it's the thing that's going to get you into a, you know, a solid career. I love that. I think that's great advice. We talk to people at labels and they say some of the new kids that come along, it's a different kind of experience. Maybe they're not going and meeting everyone at the label. Hey, how are you? Yeah. Thanks for your work on the album and for helping with my career. They're like, I'm famous. I don't have time for you. Yeah, you know, there's, you can look at it two ways. It's funny. There's, I see like young young artists that are just coming up and in a way like you see you look at them kind of like with a fascination that they kind of believe that they're the first people that have ever sold a million records or the first people that ever had a number one hit or the first people that walked into a bar you know and had people excited to see them or meet them but at the same time this business is really really hard and the idea of trying to make it isn't easy so if you don't have that kind of suspension of disbelief in you or that kind of willful ignorance to the odds then you probably wouldn't make it in the first place. Like if we had started out and we really, at one time, like if you ever read Douglas Adams, like if, if someone put us into a probability machine and we at one second could see the, the actual odds of making it, our head would have exploded and we would have just went back to a regular job. I think you kind of have to have a little bit of that. We were just lucky enough to be really naive as people. So we kind of came through and we were really happy to be there and we were really happy to meet you. Like it wasn't a put on. Do you think you've always been hungry for that? For, you know, for, for obviously for playing music but also what that entails in terms of being in the public eye is there a hunger that's that's still there that you would have had when you were I, I don't think so I think um, <clears throat> there is a rational equation that equates to if I the better that I do in my career then the more people are going to hear my music and the longer that I'll get to do it and I think within that framework it's important to me but every bit like every time that you get to a new plateau and everything that you do that pushes you further it's really just it, I'm like okay I get to make another record and I get to like write more songs and make a living playing songs. And now I'm at a point where, I mean, I'm, I'm doing fine with money and my family's fine. You know, I'm not like working to keep my kid through college anymore. I'm still just kind of working because I've, I'm still writing songs and I still want people to hear those songs. Do you find yourself having had success throughout your career writing 
to that when you write? Do you are you still no. able to write from the heart, or you sit down and think, okay, this is got to, it's got to be big? Yeah, I don't I don't think like first off, I've never I don't I've never written any songs that are about like the loneliness of the road and the <laughs> you know and, and how, how how horrible it is being confined in my giant hotel room, you know, or anything like that. Um, and I and I really think it's more every time I do something, I want to try and do something that I didn't do before. You know, if you listen to Matchbox 20 and early songs like 3 a.m., there's a kind of almost a southern Americana sense to them. And then you go flash forward to like 2004 to my first solo record with Lonely No More. You know, or even the second Matchbox bent. Like, I think each time we're trying to move it just a little bit to the left or the right. As far as we can, like, I still want it to be genuine in the sense that when I write, I've got to just sit down and write all the time and whatever comes out of me comes out of me. Yeah. Like, I've never been, I maybe just talented enough to actually sit down and go, you know, I want to write a great this kind of song, you know? Yeah. I just kind of sit down and write and whatever comes out, comes out. And then because of that, I have to write like three or four records worth of material for like one record that I think other people are really gonna like. So which means I'm not actually that good. If you think about all the horrible songs that I write, they much outweigh any song that you might like. <laughs> I mean, that's frightening in this digital age where you could probably put them somewhere on a SoundCloud and people can yeah, go there and go, oh, he's, he's lost his touch. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're out there. And, and I think I'm kind of glad that, that it didn't work that way for me because I'm sure that when I first started out, I would have thought everything I was writing was amazing and I would have just put it out there for everyone to hear, you know. The Rob but, Thomas YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. Right now, my, my odds that I know in my head they skew this way, but the visible odds of what people have heard from me, it, it, seems, like, it seems like I just write, you know, pretty steady work. Yeah. I love that. Now, I, I wrote this question. I feel bad to ask, but I won't ask it anyway. I, like it. <laughs> I can't wait to hear it. You've written out many musical trends, grunge, electronic music, brick pop, dubstep, since you started playing music. Is it fair to say that you have been enormously successful without ever trying to be fashionable? I think without a doubt. I mean, I don't think that's ever mattered to me. We, when we started out, we were, we were popular and almost by definition not cool. You know, like in the 90s, if you came out and you were selling records at some point, you just, you're not cool. Cool bands don't sell records. That's not how that works. And cool felt very important <clears throat> back in the 90s. To, to me, it did. Well, it did. I mean, if you grew up and like you loved R.E.M., R.E.M. were selling records and they were cool. They, they somehow had this thing about them. Yeah. Um, we never were a group and I never was a songwriter that kind of spoke to a certain disenfranchised member of, of the community. We write songs about people and we write songs about emotions and the way that people feel about things that happen in their lives. That's not cool, but it's true and it's honest and I think it's universal in a certain way. And so <clears throat> to me, it's cool to be here talking to you 20 some odd years later, you know, and to still be out touring and to still be making records. That's cool to me, but it's just not Fonzie cool. It's just a whole different kind of cool. Did you ever wrestle with that? Sure, in, in the very beginning, like we were, when we first came out and we had, you know, at, we were at like 10 million records and every other band was plastered on all the magazine covers and they were the band of the moment. We were never that band. We were literally, <clears throat> at 10 million records, we could walk down the street and nobody knew what we looked like. Now, a lot of those bands don't exist anymore. They don't have careers anymore. They're not making records anymore. And, and uh, we realized that that was actually a gift for us. That we, it was never, it never became about our personality. People that, that know who I am, it's not about my personal life. They don't care about who I'm sleeping with. They don't care about what I'm doing. It's really just about if I make a record and you like it, then you want to come and listen to the music I'm making. Yeah. I mean, hopefully. I love that. You seem such a nice guy. I Googled Rob, Rob Thomas controversy. And then I was like, oh, you've been in jail. <laughs> I was much more of a rock star. Like, <laughs> right, right up until I started, I got my first record deal. I was such more of a rock star from like 16 to 25. Um, and then... After that, I just it just not so much, I guess. I love it. It's always lovely to see you. Let's talk quick about uh, uh, about Chip Tooth Smile. Yep. You're touring Australia, doing all these different shows. Tell us a bit about the show, what you're playing, with the the hits that people have taken their shirts off to, and you know, <laughs> Rob, play this, play that. It's um, it, you know, after after this long, you try and and realize you try and look at who the, who the people are that are coming to see your show, and you want to give them a little bit of everything that they might want to come see. It's and it's a really good place to be in where you, you might not hit them all. You know, they might be, somebody's gonna leave and not hear something that they wanted to hear. But with the band that I have, it's the same solo band I've had since 2000, almost everybody, like 95% of them are the same one since 2005 when I did my first record. And it's, it's a family in the same way that Matchbox is a family. And everyone is about pure joy. Like our shows are about joy. They're about making sure that everybody that comes there realizes that it's not about us playing music for you. It's about all of us in the room sharing that same moment because time, every day that you get older, time becomes a little more precious to you. 
and the way that you spend it becomes precious to you. And so we don't want to come to, to a show for you to, and us not have a good time. And we don't want to come to a show and you not have a good time. So it's important for us that we all leave that room feeling like we did something together, you know, and it was, and it was a special thing. And the whole band, everyone in that band just loves to get up every night and loves to play music. And I think that's, that kind of shines through. Throw a couple of song titles at us that, that fans can expect to hear when they come see you. Well, I mean, there's a, you know, well, I don't like to do that, but we'll do, I'll say, um, there's a lot of stuff that you know from my solo stuff and a couple things here and there that are, that are peppered in from Matchbox. But because Matchbox is still a band and we still will be touring, I don't, I don't like to do songs that we wrote together as a band. So I'll do songs, like, there are certain songs in the Matchbox world that I wrote that are really super personal to me that I want to play them and, and we'll move those around throughout you know different nights and stuff but I, but I definitely will represent a little bit from the very beginning of 20 years ago all the way up till this record. How big a part of the Rob Thomas story is the song Smooth? Uh, it's, it's, it's huge. I mean it came right at the time when we were a band that had sold a lot of records but it, we, it was our first record. You know, we'd sold a lot of records of one record and it could have gone to a lot of places and me and Carlos met and became friends and then it became like instead of just the guy from Matchbox 20 it became songwriter Rob Thomas and then personally because of that I got to go work with Willie Nelson and Mick Jagger and, and uh, Seal and Mary J. Blige and write songs for all these people and then <clears throat> moved into Matchbox and, and our second record which is kind of like the kiss of death after a big record your sophomore slump and all that we had our first number one single on that second record and then it it really started to set us up to like, okay, we, we can make a career out of this. And then you move forward to that, Carlos and, and I became like brothers. Like he's one of my greatest friends in the world. We, we're both on the road in the States and every night we get off the stage and we get on the phone and we either talk or start texting each other about how things are going and send each other like stupid videos. Like he'll send me a video of like a, a review of one of his shows and I'll just be like, are, are, you, are you bragging? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm bragging. I'm like, All right, good for you. On a final note, any Australian musicians you'd like to connect with? Well, I just, I just discovered Missy Higgins uh, the other night, actually, when I was packing up in Adelaide after a show, and I put on this, like, a Storytellers that she had on, and I just thought she was an amazing songwriter. Um, you know, the NXS guys are personal friends of ours for years and years. They toured with Matchbox last time we came through. Um, there's a lot of great music out here. I'm, I'm really always just excited about not searching as much as just being open when I'm in a new place to kind of see what, what I find and what comes across and as soon as it does you kind of sound hound that or something like what, what does that, I want to know what that is you know well it's always great to see you in Australia yeah it's, it's good to see you again man thanks for the chat yeah. man lovely thanks. to see you again thanks, thanks Rob cheers thank you